welcome to the session on uh, rat pack the idea here is to give a put for thought like uh, we have been building a http application by that i mean uh, you know both uh, the traditional web applications plus the uh, rest services what we are using so we have been building these for quite some time but uh, can that be done in a better way can there be a better programming model for that right on jvm i'm sure all of you have uh, you know learned a lot about uh, functional programming and might have got uh, inspired by that but if your uh, day, day job is to develop pretty much on jvm then how some of these uh, good ideas can be brought on to jvm and uh, use them so rat pack is uh, one such effort so uh, you could call it anywhere between a frame a library and a framework it's not uh, so opinionated as uh, many frameworks but uh, uh, it's a good tool for uh, developing uh, uh, lightweight uh, say microservices or uh, gateway to microservices uh, uh, rest uh, you know uh, api for a mobile device or so so that's where uh, rat pack stands uh, rat pack was started about uh, maybe 3 years back as a groovy version of uh, sinatra but later on people found that uh, uh, much more can be done on that right by changing the programming model so as of today uh, rat pack core is uh, totally a java 8 library on top of that you have a small uh, groovy layer which makes it very easy to write a few dsls uh, rather than writing full fledged uh, methods but uh, yeah java 8 does have uh, lambdas which will make the life little bit easier but uh, if i were to uh, do everything in java 8 probably we can look at only few examples so it may take quite a bit time to explain hello world programming stuff so that kind of readability is what uh, groovy dsl will uh, bring in uh, i don't have any more slides so i'll uh, right away get into the code and uh, explain all the concepts or the programming models what i want to highlight uh, using uh, code but uh, before jumping onto that the traditional programming model is the thread per request right so whenever a request come i mean the server would have already created few hundred threads and it is ready to serve the request so whenever a request comes a thread is allocated for that request and throughout the processing of that request the thread is allocated only to that particular request right but Serving request involves several IOs, maybe calling, uh, reading a file, making uh, database calls, or maybe calling some uh, web services and getting the response. So all these times, the thread will get blocked. So what this leads to is that uh, non-optimum utilization of resource. And you, uh, if 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 really the the app is meant to be used by uh, several hundred people at the same time, you you would definitely have a lot of threads waiting on that. So scalability factor will be less with that what rat pack changes there here is uh, i'm sure uh, people are familiar with node.js so it's a similar uh, programming model is uh, followed here so where there is an event loop so the request gets assigned to event loop but whenever there is a io job it goes to a you know a separate uh, thread pool and uh, it gets processed there it comes back to the event loop and uh, it runs there uh, unlike Node.js, the typical uh, number of uh, threads in the event loop is uh, uh, number of cores uh, multiplied by two. That's the default. You could uh, change that as well. But it's few. Okay. With that, uh, feel free to ask uh, questions anytime uh, during. Okay. Let's get into the code straight away. So let me create. Uh, so one of the interesting factors is uh, you know you can run uh, Rat Pack as a simple uh, single file groovy script also uh, but i'm going to create a project here and uh, use it so to bootstrap a project i am using a utility called uh, lazy bones lazy bones will uh, you know just create a project templates for you can create templates for any of those so i say create i want the uh, rat pack how to mention the version one dot oh, rc3 is the latest version of it So the GA is supposed to be released on uh, 13th of uh, this month. And uh, RC3 right now has only one bug filed against it. So to 
for running it, I'll use a uh, Gradle. So by default, this will also create a Gradle. So I can use Gradle W. That will create the IDF for example. What I use. So that has created the uh, idea project. So I can go and launch. So this is the structure. So under rat pack, you have a rat pack dot groovy. That's a <coughs> default uh, script that gets created. Sure. Is it okay? So let me just uh, delete these things. Let's start with the handlers. So this is where you will uh, specify the the URL pattern. So by default, I'll say for uh, get. So I will uh, run Gradle in uh, continuous build mode so, so that whenever uh, there is a change in the file, automatically you know that gets a uh, build. Sorry, is it some there is an extra parameter, uh, extra uh, Yeah. No, that's required for Rat Pack. This is the handlers. Something. This is extra. I don't need the bindings right now. Let's start uh, building a simple uh, REST API where uh, typically, you know, uh, FMCG sales rep would go to the retail stores and he'll get a uh, few orders for the pro product. So we'll build some of those things here. So the first uh, one of the first thing he would want to know during the beginning of the day is which outlets to visit. So let's have uh, a web service for outlets. Okay. I'll just put this on. Now let me just uh, put some hard coded uh, data there. So I have a outlet class and uh, some mod. To get that, typically I would do is uh, get outlets. Right? Then I want to render it as a JSON response. Oh, sorry. Thank you. That's The problem to be noted here is that, so here it's a hard-coded uh, data, that's okay. But 
in your usual use case, you would make a database call and you, you would get the response and then you would try to render that. But during the database call, your processing thread will get blocked. So doing this thing on a, you know, the event loop is a very bad thing in a rat pack. So this should not be done here. Right. So the way to delegate the task to a, you know, blocking thread or to take it away from the event loop, we have to use blocking dot. get within here I'll have to place my call to get outlets okay so let me just uh, just put some data here so that gets complete and I'll assign that to a variable P and let's just see what is that what is that return right Done. If you could see what it has written, it has written a promise object. It's, so what happens here is that when you make this call, the the call is made and immediately the 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 event loop continues to the next processing the next request, right? I mean processing the next statement. There. It doesn't block. To resolve that, ultimately when the processing is done. We want to get that data and display it back to the to the client, right? So to that we can use. So let me just remove that. So in this case, first uh, render in this window, right? Uh, we'll come to that. We'll, we'll come to that. So uh, this render doesn't make sense now because I just want uh, because anyway the response is you don't know when the response is ready. You put that, then when the response is ready, you go and uh, rent. So it is the implicit parameter. So uh, the then block gets called. The default parameter is get is called uh, it, or you can go and uh, give a name also. You can give something like this. So back with that. Now that leads to an important question: What is the execution sequence, right? So what happens if I go and uh, put something here? So let's uh, say print here. That is uh, before blocking, right? And we are in blocking, so we say inside blocking. There are four parts. So, what is the execution sequence? Yeah, first thing is obvious before blocking. Yeah, what is the next? Are you, anybody has a different opinion? Yeah, so usually, yeah, in usual case, it depends on the uh, say whether uh, the you know the thread which is running separately is it run uh, did it run first or so there is there is a problem with that the result is unpredictable there so print statements may be okay but what if uh, I have a code here and says that throw exception so is it that if the exception is thrown does it have to wait for the blocking thread to finish and uh, check something right so that leads to an unpredictable result. So instead, what uh, Ratpack does is makes it uh, very predictable, and uh, you could see that. So before blocking, after <coughs> then, inside blocking, then inside then. That is the the before executing any of the blocking operation, whatever is there outside the blocking operation that gets executed. So that's why you would see that after then comes always before inside blocking. Right. But the dependency here is that. Once the inside blocking is done, then only the then part can execute. We don't know that when is that going to happen, right? So to make sure that, let's uh, add a few more detail here. I'll put thread, current thread. You can put it here also. 
just to understand where it get, gets executed. Because that's a, if you understand this, pretty much you understand the Ratpack uh, programming model. As you could see here, before blocking got executed in the compute thread, which is the event loop. Then after, which also got executed in the compute thread, inside the blocking got executed in a separate thread. You could see that it's in a rat pack blocking, right? Then the then part, whatever is executed after that blocking, that also gets executed in the compute thread. So what while programming, what you have to ensure is that all the computations happen in the compute thread and whatever is the blocking operation waiting, those have to happen, IO operations have to happen in the blocking. Yeah, that, that, that's one thing you have to make sure that. It's not a, I mean, see, after uh, getting the results, I could have converted that to JSON in the, this thread itself. Then I could have just rendered it in the then part. But, you know, converting to JSON is not an IO operation, so it's not a good practice to put that in the blocking. Blocking should be only IO, okay? Yeah, this is a CPU bound operation. All right. So, any questions? Questions? Okay, let's go ahead. So, I have a few more uh, web services which are already built. These are the microservices which this application will be using. Okay, so that is which I am running on 5051 port. So, I have want to get the product information. So that will give me product ID and uh, product name. I have one more to get the price information as well. So what we will do is we will call this and uh, return this data. Then again we will call price data and compose them together and uh, return it as a single object. Right. So let's see how we can uh, use them. Uh, let me just uh, copy paste few boilerplate code here. That is mainly for uh, you know the data structure as well as uh, converting from uh, the you know response to objects back to objects okay. yeah. so let let's say that it's a get uh, product Slash, I want to say pass the ID and uh, now I want to make a call to that web service and get the response, right? So let me say fetch product. I'll just uh, put HTTP client. I need the product ID for that, right? So to make a call, Ratpack already provides a HTTP client. That's what I'll use here. So say okay. <coughs> now. Uh, HTTP client is by default available, so I'll just inject that and pass it from here. Now, uh, that's a parameter which will be automatically injected when because uh, Ratpack is calling this. Right? Um, so I need to pass HTTP client. So I mean the the idiomatic way would be to create a service class and uh, put uh, HTTP, you know, client as an instance there and uh, make, uh, I mean, inject HTTP client into service and in inject the service into all these things. If I have multiple, uh, you know, requests, just to make it simple, I uh, will not uh, do that. Okay. And which will be string, I will convert it along. So what else? I'm making a web service call, which is again a IO request, right? So, do you think this should be executed in a blocking or in the compute thread? 
it should be in blocking, right? I'm not doing anything. Just see, I have not put a blocking dot get or anything. Uh, let me put the render done for it until we have something. Okay, so let's say product. It returned the prompts. So note that the HTTP client what Ratpack gave returns a promise by default. You don't have to. Explicitly, explicitly say that run this in the blocking thread, right? It will automatically do that for you. Now, what I want to do is, uh, I want to get the result when it is available, convert it to the object I have here as a product master, and say display it, right? So that can be, let me just say, dot uh, I say map map will take a promise and uh, return a promise uh, so the input is the response what uh, received from that which I use here uh, this one transform to product master so it is the response what I got from the web service I say body then get the bytes I using a JSON slurper I convert it to JSON then I just get the ID and the name and uh, create a new object so I say map it to master. I'll just again convert it to JSON and uh, Ah uh, no, it's a yeah. Me methods have a contract that whether they ex ex expect a you know accept a promise or uh, they accept a any ordinary type. So promise is the you know uh, API provided by Ratpack, which has got uh, several uh, methods on it. For example, here you have map. Okay. What I meant is like yeah. Correct. The right, right. You you have to know it from the API docs. When you write your own classes, you may decide to return promise if you are doing it here, or you may use one of the wrappers available. So, for example, here uh, within transform master in this closure, I did not uh, mention. There is no mention of promise anywhere. So it's already the promise is unwrapped, and finally. When the result is created, it's wrapped in, in, inside a promise and returned. That, that map function takes care of that. Uh, okay. the, uh, so whenever you call a web service, uh, you know you may have a limitation. For example, if you are dealing with the third-party request, uh, they may say that uh, so uh, say you can call, make only ten requests at a time. So if it's say if it's a Google uh, say reverse geocoding, you want to call. And uh, say all of a sudden your application is called by 50,000 users. Doesn't mean that you can make 50,000 calls to the Google API. It will not allow that. So many of the calls will simply time out. So there is a way to throttle that. So in your uh, HTTP client, you can go and say, say put here, yes. throttle of size say 20. So I, I just want to make sure that only. 20 calls happen at a time. So which is available out of the box, you don't have to write any custom solution to do that. Uh, cache will have to write explicit cache because it doesn't understand how to. Uh, you can put a transformation function in between and decide. Right. Okay, so right now I just got uh, one of them. So I'll uh, write, uh, maybe I'll just copy paste. And say I want to fetch the price, which is again the ID. So here I have received the product master. 
now that I have the product master right from that idea I want to take and make a call to the next uh, service. Uh, so I can't use a map here because the next call which is going to make a uh, going to invoke that web service is again a blocking one. So instead you have to use a flat map. Okay. So the input here is the product master what I already received from the previous uh, map. Now here I am going to call that fetch price of the HTTP client already. Product master dot id is what I am going to use, right? Then I have to, I will get a response which I have to convert it to the object I have which has uh, the price, this one. So I already have uh, class for that product price. So now what I want to do is I want to combine these both in information together and uh, create a new object for that. So that's what I did here uh, transform to product which takes a product master and price and clubs them uh, together and gives one product. which takes a uh, product master so now this will receive a product object so you get all the so now uh, this is okay but this is all applicable for only one product so it's not a good idea that uh, you know you make uh, the client makes call for each product and get that it's much better to you know you have a list of products and you get it together so let's write uh, one for that i would need a http client again So first of all, I would uh, need uh, you know product IDs. I'll say one and two in a list. So again, uh, yeah, Rat Pack uh, implements uh, uh, reactive streams. Uh, so those options are available. So you could use that. So I say I would say streams. And uh, I would have to convert uh, my list of product IDs into a string, so which uh, is done by this publish uh, function. Then I would call uh, flat map, and I can do the same uh, operations here, right? So I can call. Uh, No. So, because each ID would get passed to the flat map one by one, so the parameter itself is the value to be passed. Then, once the result comes, I have to do the same thing again. Right. Yeah. So you you have to wrap it in that. Yeah, it has to be. It's one by one. Yeah. So whatever is there inside, even if you have uh, two, you know, blocking operations. Uh, I mean, say in a blocking, if you have two IOs, uh, Ratpack is not going to run it concurrently. It's uh, run as a serial. I'll have to do one more uh, flat map. Which you can get one over here, I can put the same code. I mean, I, I ideally I can put it in a separate uh, method and call it from both places. Uh, that should work well. 
so now what i have is the it's a previously i had promise okay now i have a stream not a ordinary promise so i'll have to say i have to convert that promise to back to list and then display it This has to end before, right? So how three that should be named three? Yeah, that's how you would uh, wrap it in a uh, string. So. Uh, streams has got several other methods where you can uh, compose them uh, together very well. Uh, so I mean, again, it's a uh, uh, reactive streams uh, compliant. So uh, if you go to reactive streams, or you would find several projects which support uh, them. And uh, if you are not happy with the uh, reactive streams and you want much more powerful, uh, you know, uh, composability, then uh, you will have to use uh, Rx Java. And uh, Radpack has got a, a, you know, mod I mean, Radpack doesn't follow a plugin system. Instead, it follows a module system, so you can have a Radpack uh, RX module, which uh, helps you to you know adapt uh, uh, promise to observables and observables observables back to promise. So uh, that is something which you could uh, use. Uh, finally, let's do one of the post examples. I'll say order. Again, I'll just put something here. Then I'll say. So request I can get from the request, and I'll get the since it's a post body will contain a data. Right. So I'll change it to post. it as just uh, okay said done if you see again it's a promise so for example say you have a very big payload and uh, say the authorization fails then there is no point in uh, reading the body and parsing that and all those things. so by default uh, uh, rat pack is lazy uh, in uh, you know parsing the body so the way I can get that done is say request right. So I just want to get the text content of that. You see the same thing is equaled back. So you could do any other uh, processing before ensuring that you know whether you really need to get the body or not. Right. And uh, here also, I uh, see it's a promise. Ultimately, you want to get the content inside. The promise has to be resolved, right? So map does it automatically. So uh, here I did a very simple thing. I just getting one thing. So you can call a function, okay, which would uh, take that data promise of t, whatever t is there. Your function here can take t as a parameter and return something. No, no. So map you can pass any function. It's a uh, highly composable. Otherwise, what happens is uh, it, 
uh, beyond that it's not composable so only one time it gets and uh, yeah uh, lazy it's everywhere lazy so for example uh, here also if i don't have a then block the blocking dot get will not get called whatever is here so for example uh, Now, if I remove that, let me put a yeah. Okay. If I don't render something, it will complain. So, if you see that, it did not print anything. So that's how it's uh, it's lazy. So lazy and uh, you know composition, all those are uh, pretty much uh, what has been uh, borrowed from functional programming. So that's at a high level what I wanted to cover mainly from the since it's a SP conference. Uh, you know what are the traits of uh, functional programming that is used here to, uh, so the key focus here uh, asynchronous and uh, non-blocking. So with that, you know, you have fewer threads waiting and your application can scale very well. And this also has some uh, templating mechanisms which, with, through which you can generate the UI and all. And yeah, you could, but I have used some def somewhere, I believe. If I remove that, I can make that. Your, you will have to, you will have to. That depends on what is there inside that, right. It, if you put, it may not work. You will have to do the type, yeah. So Groovy has both the options. You can make it as, uh, you know, compile static and, uh, I mean, you can say that, check the type during uh, compilation or you can it can be dynamic also so both options are available but the 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 applic the library itself is uh, statically compiled yeah. so because of that i get all the auto completion and all if i put here you know, it shows me all those uh, handlers and all those things like that. and uh, for a very big application it may not be a good idea to put everything in one file here so always uh, whatever i put here you know uh, like uh, the the handler parts are there, right? that can be put as a separate class implementing handler interface or if you have, uh, you know, separate uh, two, three handlers together, I can put it as a, you know, a class that implements handler chain. So that way it can be further uh, put into separate modules. This is a bootstrap uh, file, right? Right, it's a, it's a script file, yeah. Right. You may have separate classes. So that. Right, right. That, that's right. So these are the quite a few modules, uh, you know, available. You could see Core is the one what we used and uh, Groovy is something on. You, you could write the entire, instead of the Groovy script, you can write it as everything as a Java class. But that would look, look very, you know, ugly to read. <laughs> so which has a juice module by default, then there are a lot of uh, other, uh, you know, Hikari, you know, connection pool is available and um, and if you are using MongoDB, you know, you could use uh, gmongo which will be, you know, pretty easy to make a call with. Uh, 
and yeah and making a you know call to other rest apis is much easier with the http client so it's using juice by default yeah juice module that's how you create all the right so if you are creating you can create it as a juice module and uh, put it there okay. and then you say uh, you know in the beginning you just uh, specify the what is the module required and for uh, security it has a pack 4j integration right now and the uh, rx is a session and also yeah, it supports uh, spring boot also so if you want to run it on top of uh, you know spring boot i mean you can use whatever is available in spring boot also that helps. maybe if you are going for slightly heavy lifting with the database connection and all you may you can use that by default you know it's uh, i mean it's Uses Netty. That's how uh, the asynchronous part works. It's a jar. It's right. Ah no, it's not concurrency exactly. It's just a uh, effective segregation of uh, you know blocking and uh, non-blocking. Uh, concurrency, there is nothing available out of the box as of now. Uh, right now it doesn't have anything. You, you could use what is provided by uh, you know Java or any of the Java implementations. Okay. Executor service or uh, you know the parallel streams, all those things you can use out of the box. How is the deployment? What is the platform? It's uh, JVM. Right, right. So when you build, yeah, when you do a Gradle build, it will generate a jar file which you can run on JVM. It requires Java 8. Uh, older versions of Java will not work. Right. Yeah, yeah. Any Java library you can integrate. Okay. And there's um, the URL part that we declared there. Yeah. Uh, that supports Unicode. Uh, I'm not very sure about that. It should support, I believe, because Java by default supports Unicode. Basically, what I'm saying is combination of Unicode and translation. So let's say it's a stack product. Yeah. It might look like a Uh, what, I, what I mean by that is, I have already created the document. Okay, okay. Uh, then it should work. So the documentation is not very exhaustive as of now. So the better way I found is to read the test to understand how to do things. <laughs> and it has been changing quite. That blocking was initially called some background, then it became blocking, then now got blocking dot get all. <laughs> And you have that uh, drop wizard, uh, you know, metrics uh, integration. Like, you know, like five microservices running on each server, and you need to set it like. Yeah, that that would be the best way to use, I believe. You know, instead of developing a very heavy application, you, yeah, you make mo more of a microservice. So then, how will they communicate with each other? Yes, that's a default option. <laughs> No, you, you you could use any of the mess no, messaging. Because it's based on messaging, you can use it. In the in the microservices, in the non policy. Ah, uh, yeah. Typ typically, yeah. Either you have to use uh, you know HTTP, or you will have to use a uh, micro uh, RabbitMQ or uh, any of the messaging. That will be another way to. Yeah, but still, it's a network uh, level. Yeah, that, that's more of a, you consider them as a two logical databases, but physically they may be one schema. Okay. But microservices are standard data, so access the database that is hidden behind the microservices, only goes to an HTTP. Uh, yeah, HTTP looks like more the preferred option these days, but uh, yeah, yeah. still I would say you could use, uh, you know, message passing is still a valid option over there also. It's a common 
Chinese of the city, that's the reason. It depends on the use case. Again, in terms of the development efforts, you, you would see monolithic versus microservices. Microservices would have slightly more uh, effort there. Um, but it's uh, like, it is for a benefit you are trading off. Those things. Well, any other questions? I'll be around uh, tomorrow as well, so if you want to discuss anything, yeah, feel free to catch me. Well, uh, thanks for attending. Have a nice day. So, very soon. I mean, the 13th is supposed to be where uh, one or two gets released. Thank you. Now it's production ready. Pretty much. This is one of the implementations. Yeah. If you still need, you can integrate to RX Java also into that. That. Ah, uh, three years. Okay. Yeah, but, but initially it started as a just groovy flavor of uh, Sinatra, but then later they thought about all this netty asynchronous and all. So, so, so the idea is that uh, you know the Grails framework is planning to put a profile with this as the base sort of thing. So that's uh, another uh, where community get, may get expanded. Then. Uh, Rat Pack as one of the profiles. Okay. So they want to put this one, then the, some Hadoop and some okay. microservices. Also. Uh, it's netty. Yeah. So you could use uh, Spring Boot as a base actually. Pack 4J is a library available there. That's uh, one of the modules. Uh, I haven't tried it out. But pack 4 j is a separate project available. Okay. So it's just an integration here. Yeah. That, that's a like it's a readily available module. You just put a, say this is a module and uh, you say this is the data source connection. That's all you have to say. Connection pulling is already. Yeah, it has. Uh. Well, thank you.